Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness, your mercy, your kindness, for the blood of your Son that cleanses from all sin, for the cross, for the eternal truth of your word and your spirit that leads us into that truth. We ask once again, Lord, that in your mercy you would pour your spirit upon us and speak to us through your word, giving us the wisdom and courage to be not only hearers of your word, but doers also. We ask this in the name of the one who saved us, the Lord Jesus, our Messiah, in his name we pray. Amen. All right. The subject I've been assigned today is Israel and the covenants of Israel. Can we get the first frame, please? Covenant with Israel. You call him Jeremiah. I'll tell you his real name. Yermi Ahu Hanavi. Yermi Ahu Hanavi. Yermiahu Hanavi. No terto, that's better. You've perhaps heard me say this before, I mentioned it in brief yesterday, but let's quote from Yermiahu Hanavi, Jeremiah 31 31 says the following Aniachtoch, literally, I will cut. I will make, I will cut a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the one I made with their fathers. It would be different. First of all, with whom would the new covenant be made? With the World Council of Churches? With the Vatican? With the church? No, it would be made with Israel and the Jews. If the covenant with Israel, the covenant purposes of God with Israel are finished, the church is finished because Jesus never made a covenant with the Jews. Never. Back again, please. Paul affirms this in Romans chapter 9, verse 4. Again, he uses the Greek word, Diatheki, plural, not covenant. The covenants belong to the Jews. In the Greek, it's present continuous active, both the old and the new. Let's begin at the beginning. It will not be like the one I made with their fathers. Here is how things first went wrong. Dr. Reagan began addressing this issue in a more narrow focus sense, looking at the issues of preterism and replacementism this morning. Let's go back and see where things went off. Think in terms of geometry. You, two lines are parallel, but if you slightly change the angle on one line, although they seem to be going in the same direction, over a period of time, you'll wind up in two different places. This went wrong, as I said yesterday, and as Dr. Reagan mentioned this morning, in the patristic era, the age of the church fathers. Well, let's look at this. It'll not be like the one I made with their fathers. As we looked at yesterday, people thought they were automatically in a covenant relationship with God because they were circumcised, because they were part of the nation Israel. I'm okay, I'm a Jew, I was born a Jew, I'm a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I was circumcised as a baby. I'm all right, I'm in. <laughs> this was a problem. Jeremiah faced this problem, Moses faced this problem. He warned of those who were circumcised, but not circumcised, because they're not circumcised of heart. John the Baptist faced this problem, Jesus faced this problem, 
And when the Messiah came and gave a new covenant, he would correct this problem with a new covenant. Paul says Jesus did correct this problem. It would not be like the one I made with their fathers. So instead of circumcising all the babies on the eighth day, I will write my law on your heart. You will make an individual decision, a faith commitment. It would not be a national covenant, a theocratic kingdom. This new covenant would divide people as well as unite them. Parents would turn against children. Children will turn against parents over faith in Jesus. Most of the Gentile church in America doesn't have to deal with that, believe me. Jews who believe do. Muslims who get saved do. People in Hindu cultures who get saved do, etc. It'll be an individual response. The rite of initiation would not be circumcision, but a circumcision of the heart, and its outward emblem would be tevila, baptism. This is going to be different. It's not going to be like that one. This is going to be a new covenant, different rules. And the beginning was okay. But by the time you get to the fourth century, Constantine the Great comes along, and he, for political motives, pseudo-Christianizes the Roman Empire. He had this great vision at Miletus Bridge and so forth. Well, he had other similar visions of a pagan nature. He never got baptized to the end of his life. He continued with pagan practices. He simply saw Christianity had a higher standard of social justice than the pagans, and it was useful to his political interest to stop the fragmentation of the Roman Empire between the Latin-speaking West and the Greek-speaking East. That was his motive. The Council of Nicaea was driven by that. He didn't care about the theology and when Easter was celebrated, he cared about preserving the unity of the church because it was an instrument to preserve the unity of the empire. It was political. Much the same as today in Texas. All the politicians are born again at election time. It's simply a... <laughs> you see the same thing in Northern Ireland. They're all good Protestants at election time. It was simply politically expedient to play the religious card. Once the election is over, it's business as usual. Well, same thing then. However, something happened. Now it's the religion of the empire. What happened, Christianity becomes Christendom. Somebody has to rewrite Christianity by redefining it, not just recontextualizing it. When Paul took the gospel, and brought it to the Gentile world, he recontextualized it. He did not redefine it. In other words, he did not change the meaning of it. He simply presented it in a culturally modified way so Greeks and Romans could understand it. But Augustine redefines it based on Plato's philosophy. He's influenced by Ambrose of Milan, by Cyprian of Carthage, who was a sacramentalist. He comes along and he spiritualizes the millennium. He says, well, that's it. The millennium has come. This is the age of the church. The emperor moves his capital from Rome to Constantinople, again, with political motives. The title of the emperor as a pagan was Pontificus Maximus, the bridge builder between faiths. He was the pontiff. Now that title becomes bequeathed to the bishop in Rome. And Augustine says... Well, here's what we're going to do. <laughs> Everybody's a Christian. He invents this doctrine of the visible and invisible church. He changes one word in one verse. What is it? Jesus said, the enemy comes and sows tares among the wheat. His disciples say, should we harvest it and get rid of it? No, you'll, you'll destroy the wheat. Let them grow together. Jesus explains the parable, and he says that the field is the world. Society is going to have 
believing and unbelieving people in it. Don't wipe it out until the full number of those who are going to be saved get saved. Augustine changes one word. He says the field is the church. The church has people who are born again and people who are not born again. It has people who are saved and not saved. Make them all members of the church. Baptism becomes the equivalent of circumcision. You understand? What Jeremiah says, back again please, what Yemiahu says, the Messiah was going to get rid of. He'd make a new covenant. Constantine puts it back. Augustine puts it back. Things go from bad to worse. The church goes from being Platonized to being Aristotelianized in the Renaissance. Then a movement comes called the Humanist Movement, led by various people such as Erasmus of Rotterdam, who gave us the Textus Receptus, and other humanist scholars like John Collett in England, left of Europe in France, etc. But from this humanist movement, people go back and read the scriptures, not on the Latin Vulgate of Jerome, but they read the Greek and Hebrew again. Luther finds out from left of your, the Greek word metanoia doesn't mean penance as in the Roman Catholic sacrament of penance. It means to repent. Luther, the penny drops. He realizes the whole Roman Catholic system is a con. Reformation happens. We're going to restore biblical Christianity. Well, if you were going to restore biblical Christianity, you'd have to do certain things. One, first and foremost, you would have to end Erastianism. You would have to put an end to the unscriptural marriage of church and state. You understand? You'd have to end the unscriptural marriage of church and state. The church is not an agency of the government. The government is not an agency of the church, as it was in Old Testament Israel. This is going to be a new covenant. But instead of divorcing this unscriptural marriage between church and state, Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, the reformers, they simply replace the Roman Catholic version with a Protestant one. They correct error with error. Luther wrote in Latin, quius regio, eius religio, whatever your government is, your religion should be. If your government is Catholic, be a Catholic. If it's Protestant, be a Protestant. So instead of reforming the church in the sense of restoring the church, they just replace one error with another. Sprinkle the babies. Mainstream Protestantism. The Reformed Church, Presbyterian Church, Lutheran Church, the Church of England, they all did it. Oh, but they pointed us back. They put us on the right road. They just didn't drive down it far enough. You understand? Well, look what's become of what they did. At least officially, at least officially, the Roman Catholic Church says same-sex marriage is wrong. At least officially, they say it's wrong. I live in Great Britain. America's going the same way. The Church of England, United Reformed Church, Church of Scotland, Presbyterian Church, Methodist Church, all of the Protestant denominations have embraced same-sex marriage. Now it's happening here. Rick Warren publicly reversed his original position on Proposition 8. He's no longer against same-sex marriage. Brian McLaren, the guru of the emergent church, performed the same-sex marriage for his son and his son's husband. These are people who say they're born again. You understand? Protestantism has become more 
morally and theologically bankrupt than what it set out to reform. I'm not defending Roman Catholicism. It is a false gospel. Amen. The blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. You do not atone in purgatory for your own. I'm not defending the horror of Babylon, but Protestantism is worse. You will not find a Roman Catholic theologian, a Jesuit, denying the historicity of the resurrection or the virgin birth. No shortage of Protestant theologians who deny it. By any barometer of church history, Protestantism is a dying religion. It's dying a self-inflicted death. You look here. What churches are growing? Asians, Hispanics, how many people here are ex-Roman Catholics? Put your hand up. <laughs> Look around. <laughs> Protestants have had the truth for 500 years and they've thrown it out the window. Amen. But the problem goes back to Jeremiah 31. Let's talk about the oldest trick in the book. Before Satan paganized the church, his first trick was to Judaize the church. Not Jewishize, it was already Jewish. He de-Jewishized it. But he re-Judaized it. Back under the law. Look at Roman Catholicism. Transubstantiation. The Eucharist is Christ incarnate under the appearances of bread and wine. He's back in a box. In the Old Testament, God was in the holy ark. He was in a box. There's going to be a new covenant. He won't be in the box anymore. We're all going to be temples of the Holy Spirit. No, the Church of Rome puts him back in the box. You understand? In the Old Covenant, you had the Levitical priesthood. In the New Covenant, it was the priesthood of all believers. Now, there's another separate priesthood, holy orders in the Roman Church, a separate clergy, you understand? Back under the law. Religions of the state, the state church, back under the law. Sprinkle the babies, call everybody a Christian just because they're born in a Christianized nation. Back under the law. They've gone back under the law. The very thing that Jesus got rid of, the very thing that Paul said he didn't get rid of, the very thing that John the Baptist said he wouldn't get rid of, the very thing that Jeremiah predicted he would get rid of, Constantine puts it back, Augustine puts it back, the Roman church puts it back, the Protestant reformers put it back, and it's still there. How do you dismantle this? Next frame, please. Let's talk about the way pastors think. I mean pastors who went to theological seminaries and Bible colleges. They're invariably taught systematic theology. Now understand, systematic theology was a human effort to try to explain the way scriptural doctrine unfolds. It is not something directly taught in scripture, it is the interpretation of scholars. And there are two kinds, two basic kinds. Now understand the first century Christians would not have recognized any of this as such. The first is dispensationalism. If you are a Baptist or a Pentecostal, or a Calvary Chapel, or a Mennonite, or Plymouth Brethren, 
During the Reformation, you would not have been considered a Protestant. You would have been called an Anabaptist. In most places, the Protestants would have killed you as fast as the Catholics. You understand? There were some people in the aftermath of the Reformation who realized the Reformers were only partially right, but they were persecuted, not just by Rome, they were persecuted by the followers of Luther and Zwingli and the Church of England. But now we have two dispensational theologies, the ordinary dispensationalists and the hyper-dispensationalists. I'll explain the difference in a moment. The other systematic theology is covenant theology, believed by Reformed churches. In other words, the Calvinists believe this one, dispensationalists believe this one. Don't let the terms confuse you. Understand why they think this way. Next frame, please. When John Nelson Darby and his friends came along, they formulated dispensationalism. They said there were different dispensations, economies of grace. Now that term actually does occur in scripture. The problem is the New Testament says there's two. They say there's seven or eight or some even nine. They don't always agree among themselves. It's interesting that neither dispensationalists or Calvinists always agree among themselves. Their scholars even disagree with each other. Now what does that tell you? I mean, they fundamentally disagree with each other on certain points. They say the first dispensation of grace was before Adam and Eve sinned, that was innocence. Once man sinned, it was human conscience. God dealt with people as individuals. Like Enoch, who walked with God, he was raptured. In the post diluvian age, after the flood, God establishes human government. That was his next dispensation, they say. Then with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the next dispensation is patriarchal promise. His promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then they say the next dispensation is the law, the Torah, when the law was given to Moses. Then they say grace, when the new covenant was given. And then they say there'll be a millennial reign of Christ if they're premillennial. That's what they say. That's what some of them say. The problem is, God also made a covenant with David. <laughs> is there seven or is there eight? And if you keep looking, you can come up with as many as ten. Now understand something. With dispensationalism, there is a basic truth in it. There is a basic amount of truth in it. But it is not a scriptural emphasis. It has some scriptural basis. But these things are not dispensations, as the scripture defines dispensations. Next frame, please. Then we have the Calvinists, the Reformed churches. As we said yesterday, the tulip was not Calvin's Calvinism. That was Beza and his followers later. Calvin was based on covenant theology. God only made two covenants, one with Adam and one with Abraham. Now this is unscriptural. There's only a grain of truth in it insofar as Abraham is the father of all who believed. He was a Gentile, God converted to Judaism, and Gentiles who accept Jesus as the Messiah also become by faith descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in a spiritual sense, not an anthropological or genetic sense. But that's as far as it goes. Nowhere does scripture say that God made only two covenants, one with Adam and one with Abraham. 
The whole premise of what Calvin taught was wrong. I'm not trying to offend anybody. But let's understand Jeremiah 31, 31. It would not be a religious state, a theocratic state anymore. Back under the law. Think of the Taliban or the Mutawa, the religious police in Saudi Arabia. We're going to have a culture comp, a ban on culture. Close all the theaters, no more pop music, nothing like that. The women have to dress a certain way and for entertainment. Well, instead of football, we're going to have public flogging. We're going to have religious police. They don't like the way your wife wears her hair, they could beat her. You can't do anything about it. You disagree with them, they kill you, they burn you. Calvin, under Calvin's regime in Geneva, over 230 people were murdered, burned alive. Not just heretics like Severitas, other people. This was copied in Scotland by the followers of John Knox, a Calvinist, and then it was copied in England by the Puritans. Think of the Puritans. When you say this stuff, back again, please. The Adamic and the Abrahamic, and there's no new covenant emphasis. That's replacement theology. You understand the church becomes Israel. <laughs> they go under Deuteronomic law. It's called theonomy. The kingdom now people take the theonomy from the hyper-Calvinists called Reconstructionists who believe this and mix it with charismania, extreme charismaticism, and you put the two together. But it's not new. In Salem, Massachusetts under the Puritans and in England under the Puritans. Spectral evidence. The Lord gave me a dream. Mary Jones has a demon. Yes, I had the same dream. Mary Jones has a demon. Well, the scripture says the testimony of two is correct. Cut a hole in the ice and tie Mary Jones to the end of a pole. They did this stuff. On the Cotton Mather, Cromwell's witch hunter general. Put Mary Jones and hundreds of other women under the ice. If she drowns, she was innocent. We made a mistake. If she doesn't drown, see, we told you she was a witch. Hang her, burn her. You know the hyper-charismatics and the deliverance stuff? You have a demon of this, you have the spirit of that. The Lord showed me a demon. Where did they get this? The Puritans did this stuff in the 1600s. They actually killed people. This happened with Salem, Massachusetts. They did the same thing as the Taliban. The Muslims call it jihad, holy war. In Britain, the English Puritan Calvinists and the Scottish Presbyterian Calvinists massacred each other in the name of Jesus Christ in their Christian jihad, to say nothing of what they did to the Catholic peasants in Ireland, etc. To this day, evangelism is a problem in Ireland because of the history of Cromwell. John Wesley said, this is the way Protestants treat the Catholics. No wonder these people don't want to get saved. That was in the 18th century. They had jihad. What else did they have? Religious police, mutawa. But something else. Muslims call it inja Allah. Everything that happens is God's perfect will. Inja Allah. <laughs> the hyper Calvinists call it predestination. He made some people to go to heaven and some people to go to hell. He creates people to torture them forever. It's his perfect will. 
philosophically, not moderate Calvinism, but extreme Calvinism, philosophically, it is not Judeo-Christian. It is Islamic. You understand? The regime in Iran respects the Puritans. They respect Calvin because they have the same spirit. They did the same things. They have the same beliefs. Enja Allah, Jahad, Mutawa. It's Islamic. God doesn't make people to go to hell. Jesus said hell was a place prepared for Satan and his angels. Well, how do they get this? The oldest trick in the book, back under the law is the beginning of it. A religious state. Look again, please. Back to the frame, please. You've got extreme dispensationalists called ultra or hyper dispensationalists. This is what they say. Well, the epistle of James, it says to the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, that was written to Jewish believers. It was the oldest book of the New Testament. They actually say the epistle of James is not for Christians, that's written to the Jews. Luther denied the epistle of James was canonical. He denied it was part of the word of God. He became a heretic. He actually denied books of the New Testament he didn't agree with. He ignored Revelation. He dismissed James and said it was not part of the New Testament. So the Protestants. The question is not what the reformers said or what Constantine said, or what Augustine said, what does the New Testament say? The New Testament says there are two, the old and the new. Law, that is Torah, and grace. Think of the Reformation as an aborted attempt to restore biblical Christianity. They got back on the right road, but then made a detour and wound up on the same wrong road as Rome and have become more spiritually, theologically, and morally bankrupt than even Rome. The World Council of Churches is as demonic as the Church of Rome. It is part of the Antichrist system. It is setting the stage for the rise of Babylon the Great. There is nothing more sick and depraved coming in the name of Christendom than the World Council of Churches and liberal Protestantism. They're as bad as Rome ever was. Let's go back. Law and grace. Two. Well, how do we understand this? Next frame, please. Let's look at Romans chapter 2, please, verses 12 to 14. All sin without the Torah will perish without the Torah. All who have sinned under the law, that is, the Torah, will be judged by the Torah. It's not the hearers of the Torah that are just before God, but the doers of the Torah will be justified. For when Gentiles, non-Jews, who do not have the law, the Torah, do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the Torah are a law to themselves. The Jews had an advantage. To them belong the oracles of God. They had it codified and written down. But its spiritual and moral teaching are found in all of us because we're imagio dei beings made in God's image and likeness. The Jews just understood it better because they had the Torah. Think of a physicist. He understands the way gravity works. He can explain it with equations. But somebody else knows that if an apple falls on their head, there's gravity, even though they don't know the equations. Romans chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. 
What advantage has the Jew? What is the benefit of circumcision? Great in every respect to them were the entreaties. The oracles of God. Yeah. They have the advantage of the Torah. It was written down and explained to them. But the Gentiles could know there was one true God. People could know you should treat others the way you want them to treat you. People could know you don't want somebody sleeping with your wife or your husband so you don't sleep with somebody else's. People could know you shouldn't steal from people because you don't want people to steal from you. The Jews just had it legally codified. Same chapter, Romans 3, verses 20 to 23. Because by works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the Torah comes knowledge of sin. But now apart from the Torah, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. And the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. All have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God. Both Jew and Gentile have sinned. The Jews just have it documented. <laughs> Where much is given, much is expected. Romans chapter 4, verse 15. For the Torah brings about wrath. But where there is no Torah, neither is there violation. If there was no law, you couldn't break it. It's not illegal. What does this mean? What is Paul trying to explain by the power of the Spirit? Next frame, please. This is what it means. Anybody can understand this. Pay attention, it's simple. If you get this, you'll never forget it. You'll understand the relationship between the two covenants. You won't need systematic theology or any other goyish spiel, because as we said yesterday. In systematic theology, the dispensationalists overstate the, the discontinuity between the Old and the New Covenant. That was law, this is grace. They overstate that. For instance, you can see tremendous demonstrations of God's grace in the Old Testament, even forgiving King Manasseh, but you can see God's anger and wrath with the fall of, of Ananias and Sapphira in the New. They are overstating a truth, okay? The covenant theology people, okay, understate the discontinuity. The relationship between the two covenants are both continuous and discontinuous. They're both evolutionary and revolutionary. You can't come down on one side or the other the way the Gentile church tries to. The New Testament does not present it in those terms. This is how the New Testament presents it. Under the Torah, under the law, think of it as gravity. If this circle was a balloon, right? The law of gravity says this balloon is going to fall to the earth. You can huff and puff and exhale CO2 into the balloon. <laughs> The only thing you're huffing and puffing and exhaling carbon dioxide is going to do is make it fall slower. But because of the law of gravity, it's still going to fall. You understand? It must come down because it operates under the law of gravity. Your best efforts... <laughs> are going to fail. It'll be futile. God demonstrates the human condition. We are under the law of sin and death because of our fallen nature. With our best human efforts not to sin, we're going to sin anyway. 
there was only one religion that God ordained, Old Testament Judaism, the Torah, not to be confused with the Talmudic Judaism of the rabbis. The purpose of the one religion God ordained, Torah, was to teach us religion doesn't work. The most unsaved people can choose is how they're going to sin, when they're going to sin, where they're going to sin, but not if. They must sin. The balloon must fall because of gravity. Because of the law. What the Torah does, the Old Testament does, it explains the physics of gravity. It explains the fallen nature of man. The Jews just had it written down and explained to them. You understand? That's the old. The balloon must come down. However, if somebody comes along and puts helium into the balloon, the law of gravity is superseded by another law in physics called the law of buoyancy. Think of the helium as the Holy Spirit. Christians may sin, but they have a choice. Even if they do sin, they're going to bounce back up. The just man falls seven times a day but gets up again. When unsaved people go up, keep the balloon up, they're only going to come down again. If a gust of wind pushes the balloon down, it's going to go back up again. <laughs> you understand? Unsaved people, the balloon must come down. Christians, it may come down, they may sin, but it will bounce back up again because we're under a different law, a more powerful law. This was nothing we could do ourselves. It's something that Jesus did for us. It's something you can't do. The only thing religion was good for, the only thing the Torah was good for, really, was to show you you can't save yourself. That we need a Messiah who kept the Torah perfectly. Now it had other functions. It kept the Jews separate from the nations. Its sacrificial system was a type, a shadow of what the Messiah would do. That's all true. But its purpose? was to show us we are fallen, we are under the law of sin and death, and we can't save ourselves, we're helpless. We need the Messiah to do for us what we can't do for ourselves. Now once he comes, the new law takes over, he gives us his spirit. Oh, that balloon may come down from time to time, a Christian may sin, but it's under a different law, it'll go back up again. Same as with unsaved people. It might go up again if you blow enough CO2 into it, but it's going to just fall again. Which law you want to be under? God demonstrates this through the example of Israel and the Jews. You understand? Now, if you were under the law of buoyancy, why would you want to go back under the law of gravity? If you were under the law of grace, why would you want to go back under the law of Torah? Yet there are people who do it. You ever hear of Seventh-day Adventists? Yeah. Trying to live under two covenants. Reformed Protestantism, replacementism, trying to live under two covenants. The lunatic fringe of the messianic movement, putting Gentiles under the law. Now don't get me wrong, my family speaks Hebrew, we have a mezuzah on the door. We've always observed Motzei Shabbat and things like that. Kept the Jewish feast in a Christocentric way. Jesus is our Passover, etc. Hanukkah, Purim, you name it, we get it. We even speak Hebrew. 
But to put it on somebody else compulsively, particularly a non-Jew, why would you want gravity when you have buoyancy? If you want to be observant for cultural reasons, 1 Corinthians 9, 1 Corinthians 7, that's perfectly scriptural. I don't eat pork or shellfish. Why? It's better for my testimony to unsaved Jews not to. Testimonial reasons, culture reasons, no problem. But legalistic reasons, no meanistic reasons, back under the law. I'm doing what Augustine did. I'm doing what Constantine did. I'm doing what the Pope did. I'm doing what Luther did. But I'm not doing what Jesus said to do. If I do that. I'm under this law. I don't want to go back under that one. Religion cannot save anybody. Nobody has ever gone to heaven because of religion. Even the Old Testament saints who kept the Torah as faithfully as they could, they were in the bosom of Abraham waiting for the Messiah to come before they could go to heaven. Jesus had to justify them the same as he did us. Nobody has ever gone to heaven because of religion. Countless people, countless people have gone to hell because of religion. Countless people will spend eternity in the lake of fire because of religion, but nobody has or ever will go to heaven because of religion. They're under the law of sin and death. They're not under the law of Christ. 1 Corinthians 9. You understand? The covenant with Israel. Which covenant do you want to be under? If you don't have a saving faith in Jesus, you've got gravity. If you're filled with his spirit, you have buoyancy. <laughs> you might fall, but you'll get up again. <laughs> Next frame. Now let's understand how this works. Look with me, please. To Romans chapter 7. Marriage is a covenant. It's a Brit. And it's a covenant that God uses to explain covenant. Remember, when Abraham made the covenant with God, in the suzerainty ritual it was called, and the flame of God went through the middle? That flame of God is called in Hebrew the Shalhevet Yah. Only the Shalhevet Yah went through the middle of the bisected carcass. Abraham didn't. God knew from the beginning he would keep the covenant. Abraham's descendants wouldn't. <laughs> he is faithful when we are unfaithful. The validity and permanency of a covenant never depend on the unfaithfulness of man, only the faithfulness of God, as we said yesterday. He is faithful. As we just sang, great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. It's better in the original Hebrew from the book of Lamentations. Mane emanata, mane emanata, shahar ha'ira hazdecha lashir. Kol maksoraili natata beshefa, mane emanata ya imadi. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. He is faithful when Jacob Prash isn't. <laughs> Thank God, because if it depended on Jacob Prash, if there was no law of gravity, they just would have had to invent it to justify that loser. But Jesus justified me. <laughs> Romans 7, let's look at it. Do you not know, brethren, I'm speaking to those who know the Torah, that the Torah has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. For the married woman is bound to, by law, to her husband while he's living. But if her husband dies, she's released from the law concerning the husband. So then, while the husband is living, she's joined to another man. She shall be called an adulteress. 
But if her husband dies, she's free from the law. So she's not an adulteress, though she's joined to another man. <coughs> Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the Torah through the body of the Messiah, that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we might bear fruit to God. Paul says we establish the Torah. He says the Torah is good if you use it wisely, rightly. How do you use the law rightly? You tell people that they've broken it and that they're in big trouble. Their only hope is that Jesus paid the price for what they did. In the purpose-driven lie, it says, <laughs> when you see a person living immorally or into substance abuse, and I was shacking up with my girlfriend, strung out on cocaine, I know about that. Not that I'm boasting of my sin. Jesus died for what I did, but I know what it's like to live immorally and to be into substance abuse. And I'm not proud of it, believe me, but that's what I did. He says, don't tell them to repent. We have to be seeker friendly. We have to give a positive message. Just tell them they need Jesus in their life. He's confusing justification with sanctification. I've explained this before. If they don't repent, Jesus isn't coming into their life. It's a false gospel. Show them the law, then you can show them grace. If they don't understand the old, they won't understand the new. So this woman has a husband and he makes reasonable demands. Reasonable. But she just can't do it. So her husband dies. Now she's free of him. And she marries this other guy who makes the same demands. Only he does it for her. Say she's a lousy cook. My wife is a mathematician. Her equations are great. The problem is you can't eat them. So instead of going out to Pizza Hut the way I would do, <laughs> glad you can laugh. This husband cooks the dinner for her. <laughs> we can't do it. There's nothing wrong with the demands of God, but there's something wrong with us. So he who knew no sin became sin. He kept the Torah for us. Why the death? To atone for sin? Yes. But to set us free from the law of sin. Because as long as there was no death, the law still applied. You understand? Only what Paul is saying is this. Jesus didn't just say, I'm going to die in your place. He said, pick up your cross and follow me. Get up here and die with me. Hey, Jacob Prash, come here, you stupid coke addict. Pull that hypodermic needle out of your vein. Don't ever do it again. I'm going to crucify that loser, coke-addicted junkie. I'm going to kill that coke junkie. Get up here and die with me, Jacob. I've never taken another shot. Not because of me, because of him. Yeah. Wake up in the morning, fornicate with your girlfriend, roll a joint, have a whack of coke. No, why, why did you stop doing that? I didn't. He killed me. <laughs> Once you're dead, you're not under the law anymore. He died my death 
to give me his life. That's grace. That's the real covenant with Israel. The new one. Well, let's look further. Look at Galatians chapter 5, please. Verse 14, the whole law is fulfilled in one word. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's quite a thing. But until the love of Jesus came into me, I couldn't love my neighbor as myself. I couldn't even love myself. If I did, I wouldn't have tried to kill myself virtually with drugs. I mean, I didn't set out to commit suicide, but that's what I was doing. You know how many friends I've got that are dead from drugs? The only reason I'm alive is one reason. Because of him. My life was nuts. I had a biochemistry exam in the university. Take some speed and hit the books. That's how I survived. That's not how I got through college. What a way to live. What a way to think. It's so sick. I was under the law. I had what society called the drug problem. I didn't have any drug problem. I had a sin problem. <laughs> it wasn't drugs. It would have been something else. I was under the law. The law. Who wants to go back under the law? Which covenant do you want to be under? You see this shadow? That shadow teaches something about my hand anatomically. The law teaches us about God. We can know about God because of the law. The Torah can teach you about God. You can know about God through the Torah. But under grace, you can know God. <laughs> There's a big difference between knowing about God and knowing God. I have had a, something of a fascination with Winston Churchill. I read things about Winston Churchill in books and so on. But I knew a Christian member of parliament in England who knew Churchill. He didn't just know about Churchill, he knew Winston Churchill. Through the Torah, I can know about Hashem, about God. Through the Messiah, I can know God. Once the hand comes, who needs the shadow? However, Unless you understand the shadow, you will not be able to properly identify the hand. That same Jesus of love, of mercy, of grace, of forgiveness, of compassion is the same Jesus who is angry and in whom the wrath of God is boiling, saying, I wish it was already kindled. You can't know his grace until you know his anger. You can't know his forgiveness and compassion until we know his holiness. The law teaches one. Grace teaches the other. That's the nature of the two covenants. The covenants with Israel. Well, let's understand this just a little further. Look with me, please, to... Hebrews chapter 5. Verse 10, being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, Melchizedek, the king of righteousness. Concerning him we have much to say, but it's hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for somebody to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. 
and you've come to need milk and not solid food. Everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness. He's a baby. But solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. A baby crawls around on the carpet when it's a toddler. Anything that kid can put in his mouth, he's going to. His mother's got to take everything and put it where the baby can't reach it because everything is a cookie or candy or a biscuit. That kid's going to eat anything they can get in their mouth. They don't know any better. He's only had milk. The same is true of Christians. Why are they reading the purpose-driven lie and a heretical piece of junk by a that a man who does, denies that Jesus died for sin called the shack. Why did people believe the emergent church and Mark Driscoll and all this stuff? Why did they believe this crazy stuff? Because they're like babies. How can you be saved 20 years and still be a baby? Easy, just keep feeding the milk. Their senses are not trained to discern the word of righteousness. The pastors never weaned them onto solid food. Apart from the book of Revelation, which follows the themes and motifs of the Old Testament, apart from Revelation, the New Testament is mainly milk. The Old Testament is mainly milk. Meat, you understand? You will not properly understand the New Testament unless you understand it as the fulfillment of the old. Think of an unsaved Jew. They will not properly understand the Torah unless they understand how it's fulfilled in Jesus as the Messiah. So too, a Christian will not understand the New Testament unless they understand how it fulfills the Torah. Say you got a paramedic in California, and they like their job, they're pretty good at it. So they decide, well, you know, I think maybe I, I need to progress in my profession. I want to go to medical college, I want to be a physician. I really, I, I really have a knack for this, and I like it, and I'm helping people, and it's challenging, and I want to do this. So they go to medical college, but nobody teaches them medicine right away. They teach them biochemistry and physiology. Well, this is prothrombinase. It's a protein. It synthesizes prothrombin, which causes blood to clot. Well, when I was a paramedic, all I had to do was learn how to tourniquet it and get the person to the hospital before they hemorrhaged. Yeah, but now you have to understand how anticoagulants work. <laughs> If a policeman wants to become a lawyer, if a paramedic wants to be a physician, if an electrical technician wants to become an electrical engineer, the milk will only take you so far. Now you've got to get into the meats. <laughs> milk is for babies. You've been saved a year, two years. Drink your milk, Junior. You've been saved five years, ten years? You've never been taught the Tanakh, the Old Testament? Then you only have a superficial baby food understanding of the new. You hear what I said? Oh, it's fulfilled in Christ. We don't need it. Unless you understand how he fulfills it, you don't even know what you're talking about. Can we go back to the two balloons, please? Has anybody ever heard Law and Grace explained this way? How many people? Well, almost nobody, if anybody. Has this changed your way of thinking about the covenants? Why? Because somebody showed you how the new fulfills the old, right? You can look at a hand, 
But if you look at an MRI scan or an X-ray, you'll see what's inside. <laughs> Law and grace, old and new. The covenant with Israel, it's not about the covenant with Israel. It's about the covenants with Israel. Dietike, the old and the new. You can't have one without the other. Don't believe the purpose-driven lie. Don't believe the baby food merchants. You're never going to understand grace until you understand law. You never are going to understand the new unless you understand the old. If you've been saved a year, two years, drink your milk. If you've been saved five years, you've been saved ten years, take the crayon out of your mouth and eat your dinner. God bless. <laughs> <laughs>